Good evening, everybody. Tonight's show is about Pasha's Chai Sora. Specifically, I want to talk about the Maras Mechpela. Mechpela comes to the notion of the expression, the translation is, the root is kefel, to kefela, to double something. What is the idea, on a deeper level, we want to try and exp- explain tonight what the idea of the, the name Machpelah, and what it indicates, what it signifies. And really, there are two worldviews that we want to talk about. I want to start off with bringing a posik from uh, Pasha's Vo'era in Shmos, and it describes the um, confrontation between Aaron and the Chatumim, the sorcerers, sorcerers, sorcerers of Mitzrayim, magicians, and each one of them, if you remember, Yeshlechu, Yeshlechu Ish Matei, which one of them threw down their, their staffs, their rods, Vayu Lesaninim, and they turned into serpents. And the rod, the serpent, of uh, the rod that, uh, that Aaron threw down became a serpent, and that serpent swallowed all of the others. Now, what is the symbolism here? It says that when Aaron's staff swallowed the staffs of the magicians and remained as slim as before, Paro started to fear that the staff, quote, would swallow him and his throne. Would swallow him and his throne. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of interesting because... If Paro was concerned that the staff would swallow him, what does he care about his throne for? Why would he be concerned what happened after he gets swallowed? There's a famous poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley, one of the English romantics. Very famous poem. We were made to learn it in school. I don't know if that was true in America as well, but it goes like this. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked and the heart that fed, And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. A superb, supreme irony. When Ozymandias wrote those, engraved those words into the statues, the obelisks of this enormous palace and empire, he intended that people should be overawed by the majesty of his kingdom. And the irony is that the truth be told, look upon my works, he mighty in despair, because you see everything eventually crumbles into dust. Everything crumbles into dust for somebody who has a connection only to this world. Somebody who doesn't believe in a world to come. How frightening is the finality of his earthly existence? So what does he do? He tries to create artifacts which represent the power of the brief walk that he has in this world. And, of course, his hope is that he will achieve a kind of eternity, a kind of olam haba in olam azer, fame. I remember there was a famous um, there was a film, I think, but a hit song in the, wow, way back when, a couple of hundred years ago, called Fame, I Want to Live Forever. The olam haba of the person who has no belief in olam haba is fame. Even if I'm not here, then people will remember me and in some way, which of course will be cold comfort, the person who has already departed and lying several feet under the turf, but people will know what his name was. He was the man who painted such and such, who dreamed up the world's most advanced advanced mousetrap, 
who murdered the most fame, world's most famous pop star as he stopped out of, stepped out of his limo. And that is the concept of Olam Haba. To Paro, there was one thing worse than dying, and that was that his throne, his fame, and everything that he hoped would leave in this world would be swallowed up along with him, and there would be no memory of his enormous power. I guess in some ways he would have been happy with Ozymandias' bequest to the travelers of the desert. Most people think of life as a, a trip through a treasure house of experiences. Living it up is synonymous with living itself. White water rafting, paragliding, sipping margaritas around the pool, seeing the Mona Lisa or the periods or climbing Mount Everest. That's what life is all about. This view of life sees existence as a compendium of possibilities. And he who dies with the most toys or the most trophies wins. So according to this view, someone who lives his life without really tasting any of life's countless experiences, winning of any of life's trophies, really hasn't lived. The eulogy, he had a good life, usually means that the person used his time to maximize his experiences in this world. And someone who hasn't experienced any of this life's myriad delights is considered to have wasted his life. Judaism views, Judaism's view of the world is exactly the polar opposite. We see life's experiences are like Cinderella. They last, by definition, for as long as you experience them. That's what an experience means. It's an experience only while you're experiencing it. However sweet, however exciting they be, there comes the moment when the gilded coach turns back into a pumpkin. So... Every moment of life is passing, 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 constantly vanishing forever. <clears throat> as one, as soon as the taste of one moment has expired, so a person wants to seek a new taste, a new experience. Now, if life is really the, if you look at life this way, and it's life is the sum total of your experiences, then really, if you think about it, your life is really a kind of ongoing death because every experience is. Dying is dying, and on to the next one, moment to moment. So you're, you're running, you're never able to possess the moment because that experience now, now died, it's gone, on to the next. Judaism understands that all the pleasures, all the experience of this world are given for one reason only, that we might feel, we might sense to the smallest degree the taste of life itself. And what is the taste of life itself? If not for the experiences that it contains. Imagine... Let's try and explain what the taste of life itself is. Imagine you're standing in front, God forbid, of a firing squad. And you're staring down the long black tunnel of the barrel of a rif rifle, several rifles. Squad, take aim. Ready. And just at that second, the messenger comes running into the town square. Stop the execution. The prisoner is free to go. How do you feel at that moment? That is the experience of life itself. The knowledge of being alive. Alive. Now, when we're, our, lang, our lives hang in the balance, when we're safe from a life-threatening situation, the, that euphoria, that, of course, it fades very quickly, but that immediate sense of being alive is the perception of life itself. And that's why I understand the reason why these dangerous uh, gravity sports like bungee jumping, mountaineering, downhill racing and the like, all of these hair breadth, not to mention hair brained encounters with near death, stimulates the sense of life itself. That's why they're so popular. Well, there's another, less, far less dramatic and infinitely more spiritually uplifting and more real experience that one can taste the taste of life itself. And the Gemara teaches us, it's in Rosh Hashanah, Laf Amad, Lamad Aleph, Amad Aleph, Zodavora, Vodazora, Tes, Amad Aleph. 
This world, as we know it, will last for 6,000 years. And we're getting towards the end of that. And in the seventh millennium, that's about 230 odd years from now, the world will undergo a fundamental change. At that time, all activity will cease. That world is known as Olam Haba, literally the world to come. If we were try to imagine that future world, it would be like one continuous Shabbat. Shabbat is really a hint of that future world, the faintest whisper of that reality. Me'ain Olam Haba. And on Shabbat, we are bidden to refrain from very specifically defined creative quote-unquote work. By doing this, we are able to plug in and contact with something which is essentially beyond this world. The essence of the future world is that it is an existence devoid of all activity. Yom Shakula Shabbos. And when all activity, all competition, or striving for the individual experiences, the trophies of this world cease, we will be able to perceive being life itself. In the world that we, which we live now, as I said, we can't distinguish between life's experiences and life itself. We really understand, we make the mistake to that life is, the, is identical with our, our experiences that we put into it. That's not true. The activity, the toing and froing, the getting and going of this world masks the perception of life itself, which is the Yom Shakula Shabbos. And when all activity in that sense ceases, we will experience the taste of life itself. And when we experience that, it will be the sweetest thing that can be. I've often said that Judaism is about making the present into the future before it becomes the past. Most of us, most people, as I said, spend their life trying to amass trophies. But if you look at the foundation of Judaism, of Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and let's start principally with Sarah and Abraham, as I said, the Torah goes into great detail about the purchase of the Mara Samech Pela, the burial cave. Excuse me. Why is the acquisition of this tomb so important? What does it represent? So the significance of Mara, Mara Samech Pela is not the prospect of being buried next to Adam and Chava. Instead, its importance lies in the fact that it is Machpelah. It's the Maras Machpelah. As we said before, that means kefal, that means doubled. Doubled. Now, anyone who's buried there, Chazal teaches, that will be promised a double reward. A double reward. It's important to understand that kefal, double, does not mean one and one. Rather, it indicates it's the same thing repeated. It's kaful. It's the same thing repeated, not one and one, not two separate individual things. It is the same thing doubled. The Torah begins with the letter base, bet, which teaches us that there are two beginnings. Or actually, more accurately, one beginning which has two outgrowths from it. Heaven and earth, bet. There are two, two existences, heaven and earth. Earth, or this world, is, as Chazal teaches, the realm of work. Hayom la'asotam. Hayom la'asosam. Today, to do them, the mitzvot, and macha l'kabel scharam. Tomorrow, to receive the reward. That's a Gemara in uh, Eruvin. Today, the Asosam to do them, Macha Makabal Scharam, and tomorrow to receive their rewards. And the two realms where these two activities uh, take place are Olam Azer and Olam Habba. The Rambam points out 
that if you would ask me for the corollary of Olam Hazer, of this world, it's not Olam Habo. The corollary of Olam Hazer, which should be this world, should be that world, which in Hebrew should be Olam Hahu. Olam Hazer, Olam Hahu. Why do we call it Olam Habo? Because Olam Habo is the world that comes as a direct doubling of one's work in this world. The two worlds of Olam Hazer and Olam Habo of Aretz, Vashamayim, Shamayim Vaaretz, Aretz Vashamayim. Aretz, the word Aretz is connected to the word Ratz in Hebrew, which means to run. This is a world of striving. Ritza, running. Ratzon is the same word because Ratzon, the desire, the will, expresses where a person wants to get, get to. Ani Ratz Vasham, Aretz is the future. All of this world. The importance of this world is predicated on, on something which is beyond this world. It's at the future tense, arat, arutz, I will run. Future tense, eretz, arutz. This world is positioned, is focused on something which is beyond this world. Aratz, arutz, where will arutz, arutz, l'sham, to there. Sham, sham, shomayim. Shamayim can also be read as shamim, the plural of the word there. In other words... Shamayim is the sum total of all the possible theirs that can ever be. The sum total of all the strivings, of all the ritza, the ratzon, the desire of this world, of the hayom la sosam, arrives in Shamayim, all the shams, umacha lekabel scharum. The kefal of ma'aras ha'mechpala, machpela, lies in the secret of this doubling. Because, you see, when we talk about Hayom La Sosom, Umachal Kabul Scharom, it has to be understood that we're not talking about a, a, the normal understanding of when a person works, the work is one activity, and the reward is a separate activity. This is not we're talk, what we're talking about. And we've seen this clearly from another Mama Chazal, as it says in Meseches uh, Avois, Shecha Mitzvah Mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Now, this could be understood and is understood to mean that when you do a mitzvah, the reward is that you are presented with the opportunity to do another mitzvah. But there's another, and I think deeper understanding. The reward, the reward for the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. It's the kefelut, the doubling. Now, in order to understand this idea of what it means, the tzcha mitzvah mitzvah, we have to go back to understand something which happened right at, back in, in Bereshis, in Perik Aleph, Posuk, Yud Aleph. Ayoma Elokim, and God said, Tad she ha'aretz deshe, that the land should sprout forth with grass, Asev, Mazria, Zera. Uh, grass is sprouting seed. Now listen carefully. Eitz pri ose pri. Literally, a fruit tree, eitz pri, ose pri, making fruit. Lamino according to its kind. Asher ala oretz Now, in the very next posuk, what actually happened? That was the command that a Kodesh Baruch Hu told the land to bring forth an eight pri, ose pri, a fruit tree bring, making fruit. The next posik said, for tote oritz, and what did the, the oritz actually do? For tote oritz, deshe, esev, mazria, zara, lemineu, ve, eight ose pri. What happened to the eight pri? The f- previous posik, the command that the Kodesh Baruch Hu said was, to the land, bring forth an eight pri ose pri. What the land actually did, what the arts actually did, was to bring forth an eight ose pri, not an eight pri ose pri. Now, it's a separate discussion, which we're not going to go into now, how it was possible for the arts not to fulfill what Hashem told it to do. Maharal speaks about that. What I want to speak about is what is the difference between an, an eight pri ose pri world and an eight 
Osef Pri world. Clearly, the ideal of the Eitz Pri Osef Pri is not the world we live in. Chazal teaches that the Eitz Pri Osef Pri meant that the Eitz Pri, quite literally, the fruit tree, the taste of the tree itself, tasted like the fruit of the tree. The fruit and the tree tasted identical. We live in a world which is Eitz Osef Pri, meaning the tree does not taste of the fruit, the tree tastes of bark, of wood. But that's because of the land's not fulfilling the Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Again, that's not a discussion for now how that's possible. But what we, we live in a world where there's a disconnect between the manufacture and the product, meaning when in this world when we do the mitzvahs, we do not have the experience of the internality internality of what that mitzvah really tastes like. When we put on tefillin in the morning, even though we might understand that we're doing something very good and we're fulfilling the rots and Hashem, but we, it's a dry action. It's as tasty as eating wood. Again, we understand we're doing the right thing, but the tasting, the fruit of that mitzvah is beyond us because we live in a world where it's an eitz osepri world. When we say scha mitzvah mitzvah, it means that in the world to come, in the Shamayim, after the Hayom La Sosam, the scha that we are Makabel is not a different scha. It's the scha mitzvah mitzvah, it's the mitzvah itself is revealed to us as it really is. The taste is revealed to us. That's where, that's what it means, the scha mitzvah is the mitzvah, is the experiencing of the mitzvah in its true state, in its, in its the, the panemius of that, the, the taste of it. <clears throat> the next world, Gan Eden, is a place in which we eat the fruit. While when a person eats fruit, he knows that everything about that fruit really comes from the tree. He knows that all of his, the scha comes from his efforts. The tree, therefore, holds within it the unrealized potential for that taste. The fruits of Gan Eden are really the products of the trees which are represented by our Maisim Tovah Mitzvahs in this world. The scha mitzvah mitzvah, because the fruits are the good taste, as we said, are the panemius of those dry actions, dry to us anyway, because we live in a world where it's impossible after the chet of Adam Arishan and to connect with the chet of the, the soil, the, uh, the soil itself. And as I said, that's not for now. We can't taste the flavor of the tree in this world because if we could, if we understood if we really tasted the potential locked in our deeds, if we really could taste the tree itself, we would go mashuga doing mitzvahs all day long. When we taste the ultimate fruit, we retroactively experience the sweetness that lies hidden within those mitzvahs. So, qualifying for burial in Maras HaMech Pela. It should be started to become clear now where I want to go with this. Mach Pela means careful, doubled. Doubling means that you take every single second of this world and you convert it into something which is the fruits of the world to come. Every moment in this world is producing fruits in the world to come. A life where the fruits are the kefel of the deeds. As I said before, kefel, double, doesn't mean one on one. It means the same thing repeated on a higher, a deeper level. That's shamayim, all the shams of all the actions that we did. All of those who are buried in Maras, Maras Machpelah lived 
this life of Kefal. If you think about it, Anam Arisham was born in Gad Eden. He was born not in the world we live in. He began his life in the world that would become Olam Habo, in the place where the revelation of the taste in the action itself was already present until we lost it. The Avois and the Imois also joined these two worlds together. As we know, the Gemara says, Avram Avinu sits at the threshold of Gehinnom and he pulls out those who have a bris, with certain exceptions, and he brings them to the world of Scha. He is the bridge between this world and the world to come. Kefal. Yitzhak was prepared to give up his life at the Arcada. He lived the life in Olam Azair in the way we will live it at the end of time. And that's why Yitzchok, the letters of Yitzchok can be rearranged to spell Ketz Chai, the end of life, the life one lives at the end of time, which represents Tchiyas Amesim. That's why the second bracha in Shmon Esrei is Tchiyas Amesim, is the bracha bracha of Yitzchok. And the finally, how do we see that Yaakov Avinu straddled these two worlds? As it says, Yaakov Avinu didn't die, no mace. Meaning no process of death was necessary for Yaakov to transit from this world to the next. Although he appeared to die like everyone else. Yaakov too lived this life, lived Olam Abba in Olam Azar. And although he describes the first 130 years of his life as few and bitter, his final 17 years in Mitzrayim were, when he was united with Yosef, were without pain. The Gematria of Tov, Tet, Vov, and Bet is 17, which is the years of Tov, Yaakov Vinu. Tov is an allusion to Olam Haba. The book of Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs, is a metaphor for the relationship between the Kodesh Baruch Hu and Klal Yisrael. Shir Hashirim describes our awesome, unique bond of love with Hashem and our intense feelings of longing. The wealth of even the wealthiest person in the world is nothing compared to the value we place on our relationship with Hashem when we understand that relationship. As it says in Shir Hashim, Maim Rabim Lo Yuchulu Lachabois Es Ha'ava Unahores Lo Yish Tafua Im Yitain Ish Es Kol Hon Beisoy Ba'ahava Boiz Yovozu Boy Lo Maim Rabim, many waters cannot extinguish love and rivers cannot flood it. Were a person to offer all of the wealth of his house for that love, to buy that love, the person who was being asked to sell up, to sell that love, he would disparage him. He would dis- he'd turn him away, turn up his nose. <clears throat> when we're talking about Kefal also, we talked before about Shabbos. Everything about Shabbos is double. Shabbos represents the Kefal of Olam Hazel and Olam Abba, as we said before. And that's hinted to, that Kefal, that Machpelah. We know that on Shabbos there was a double portion of the mon, which fell in preparation for Shabbos on Friday. There are two lambs which are sacrificed on Shabbos, not just one. The penalty for the desecration of Shabbos Chalila is a kefal, as it's said by the words that a person who's machalel Shabbos is mos yumos. Literally, mos yumos, in Hebrew, the way you emphasize something is to double it. But here we can understand it more literally. It's a double death, so to speak. Most you must. And uh, 
correspondingly, therefore, the, the keeping of Shabbos, the guarding of Shabbos, the opposite of Chilu Shabbos, is also a double reward. And the Shia that we say on Shabbos is also double. We say, Mizmo Shia Liyoma Shabbos, not Mizmo Liyoma Shabbos or Shia Liyoma Shabbos, Mizmo Shia, double. This all hints to the expression of the fact that Shabbos is the whisper, as we said before, of that world of Kefal. Avram, as we said, and the others lived in both realms. He was able to span the Olam Hazer and turn it into the Olam Haba. Through Gematria, we can understand the world, even the word Machpelah hints at Avraham. The Gematria of Machpelah is 175, which are the number of years that Avraham lived. All of Avraham's years related to the Machpelah of every single second being transformed and translated into that world of Kefal. <laughs> With time, however, the example of Avram Avinu was lost. The Rambam says the root that Avram planted was almost lost, and the world almost entirely returned to its confused state. And we found ourselves trapped in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. And that redemption from Mitzrayim, that restored Avram's message to the world and redefined the value of the world. And for this reason, it says that we brought everything of value that they had out of Mitzrayim, like stripping the deep waters of fish, a store without grain, Chazal teaches. Mitzrayim was the greatest kingdom of its time. No slave ever fled Mitzrayim. Why? Because it was better being a slave in Mitzrayim than living independently anywhere else in the world. And we, the Jewish people, emptied that value system. We emptied it, and we left the place like a, a pond without fish. We took everything of value, and we transferred that value. We transformed that value. <clears throat> And it had to happen that way because an integral part of our redemption was to empty out the value of Mitzrayim, the world that sees this world as a series of trophies, as we spoke at the beginning, and redefined what life is all about. <clears throat> We're Avram's children, and we need to be the standard bearers of his legacy. He bequeathed to us the idea that everything has to be weighed, everything we have in this world, all acquisition has to be focused, pointed, directed, employed for one reason and one reason only, is to hayom lasosam umacha lakabu scharam schar mitzvah mitzvah, to use everything within our grasp to be able to convert that into a real currency. Here in the days of footsteps of Mashiach, we see there is a world which is besotted with the idea of power and pleasure. And we also see the fallacy of that pseudo-value. Avram was told by Hashem not to fear. He promised that he would shield Avraham and revealed that his reward would be very great. Hashem is called the Magain Avraham. If we do not perpetuate Avram's gift to the world, Avram's perception of reality, who will be our shield? <clears throat> the Torah provides us, as I said before, with uncommon detail about Avram's real estate acquisition, so to speak. And as a result, Maras Machpelah is one of the three things that the world cannot take from us. That's a Yalkut Shimoni and Bereshis. We need to hold on tenaciously to what is truly ours. That doesn't necessarily mean holding tenaciously on to the land. I'm not going into discussions about that. I'm saying our possession of the land depends on, to, on the extent that we personify and we perpetuate the 
understanding of Avram Avinu and the Avos and all of those buried in the Maras Machpelah to the extent that we are not lured into the pseudo-values of the world, and we understand that everything in this world will be, is capable of being doubled and revealed on its true and deeper level, to that extent, we can turn everything in this world of seeming material bounty, the trap of material bounty. We can turn it into something which is eternal. We can turn the present into the future before it becomes the past. Hashem should help us, that we should rise to the occasion, especially in these troubled times, to exemplify to the world that everything we do in this world is only for the covet of Hashem. And Hashem should bring very, very soon the Gula Shalema when our Achiza on this land will not need to be fought for in blood and tragedy, but it will become perfectly obvious to all the dwellers of, on the earth when the world will be filled with the knowledge of Torah and Hashem and the Redeemer will come, Bimheira, Bimeinu, Benoma, Amen.